<clears throat> we're like brothers in the Lord, and uh, it's just from the time I met Nate and, and Evan, it's just a natural just connection, and uh, we've just had so much fun together and seen God do so much. And, of course, love this house, been a part of this house now for, shoot, what, five years uh, we've been here, and got to know a lot of you guys, and uh, some of y'all got to know us. Got to know us a little bit. This is the first time we brought our kids. We don't have our littles, so Joshua and Mercy are our younger kids. But we wanted to they they kind of take over every environment they're in. So we figured we'd bring our older ones and do a quality time. We've been in Oklahoma spending some quality time with the girls hunting, and uh, girls do hunt too. Any girls in here hunt? Come on, come on. Girls are better at hunting actually. They pay attention more. I'm like. Deer come out like, shoot it. They're like, ah, I'm going to wait on another one. I was like, what's wrong with you? <laughs> you know? Guys jerk the trigger. Girls squeeze the trigger. They're like, you know? So, uh, so we, had a good, we had a good time together. But uh, So this is stand-up. This is Grace. And uh, she is just a sweetie pie. And so glad to have her here. And this is Hope right here. And so y'all say hey to Hope. And... So me and Joy pastored for 13 years, but they were littles at the time. So they actually, uh, we've been, I'm in the business world, and Joy's uh, in the child raising space right now. We're pretty deep into it. And, uh, and so this is, a, this is a new era for them, so we wanted them to be able to piggyback. And, and so went, we moved to Reading about uh, five years ago. Uh, is that right? I'm not good with dates. Five years ago. Like, I'm not the person you want to ask for my kids' birthdays. You don't want to ask me what day I moved somewhere. You don't ask me where I... Look, I don't even know how, what day of the week it is. It's Sunday because I'm at church. So I've been gone for 21 days. I, no, 18 days. 20 days. <laughs> you see what I'm saying? I left on the 29th, whenever that was. And uh, I had four different hunting trips with clients. I sell recreational hunting and fishing trips for a living as well. And so it's all just been a blur. Is there a, uh, is there a Paul somewhere in this house? Anywhere? My... Paul? Okay, Paul. We've got a Paul up here. Hope, why don't you come up here for a second? How many of y'all know there's no junior Holy Spirit? Now, I hear that y'all have powerful things going on in the children's ministry. I know we've been camped on that, that even last time we were here, we just had such a prophetic inclination that God has something just in store for the children of this house and the youth of this house. I mean, that's the future of this house, right? You know, what's wrong with our world today? We need the littles coming up and being positioned and being groomed to, you know, they're 10 years, 15 years, they're electing the next president. You know what I'm saying? So, so I believe that young people are, are to be activated. I believe that young people uh, hear from God clearly. I believe there's no junior Holy Spirit. And I'm over here on a hunting trip, actually taking a nap, doing the most spiritual thing of the week. And, uh, and, uh, my daughter comes up to me. She says, I think I got this word for somebody in the church named Paul. So I'm going to let her share it. And uh, so, Paul, we've got something for you. And we feel like this is what God's saying. Do you want to read it? Sure. So I saw a vision of the ocean, no waves, and everybody was sitting on the surfboard just waiting to catch a wave, but nothing happened. Um, and then you arrived at the beach, um, threw your beach stuff on the ground, and just jumped in with your board. And right as you touched the water, there was just waves and everybody was catching them. Um, every, yeah. And then I think this means you're just so encouraging. And with one touch, you can just encourage um, anyone and bring wind, waves, spirit, and the breath of God. And I think anywhere you go, I feel like the Lord just wants you to keep doing that because you're so power in the way you encourage. Um, just bring so much joy to everyone around you. So, yeah. 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 So. Take, take the mic with you. Give it to uh, Evan. So how many of y'all, how many of these powerful, uh, you know, kids actually hear a little clearer, I think, from the Lord than we do because we train ourselves how not to hear from God because life experiences, situations, circumstances teach us and kind of bump us out of that place of natural hearing. And, you know, me and Jake talked last night. It was funny. We left the deer camp. And we got in the truck, and it's a three-hour, like, grind, you know. When you've got to drive three hours and you're leaving at, like, 9, 10 o'clock at night, you're like, oh, this is going to be just, ugh. And it was funny. It was like the road to Emmaus where those guys walked with Jesus. Do you know they walked with him seven miles in one direction? You know how long it takes to walk seven miles? But you're walking with the king of the universe, and they said, didn't our hearts burn within us? And we were taking this walk, and what took seven miles seemed like seven seconds you know they weren't weary and, and that was what happened last night when we started talking and I'm like are we here we did bust up a 30 pack at Chick-fil-a 
on the way. I busted up at 30. Jake's like, how many sauces? I'm like, 15. Check the bag. Don't drive off without checking the bag. You're going to go all the way back through the long line again. We had a break, mental breakdown on a vacation not too long ago because they, we thought they only put, somebody shifted the bag and it like fell or something and we pulled the bags out and we opened our 30 pack and there was three, we thought we had three sauces. Mercy's crying. Joshua's <laughs> leaving the family. Borderline cuss words. <laughs> Don't be messing <laughs> with the sauce. It's like 300 calories. So good, though. It's so good. So, uh, but no, we, uh, we just had a time just, you know, that, that when, uh, when the Holy Spirit shows up in the circumstances or situations, things can happen really fast. Things that can seem like they take a long time can go really quick. And when we camped, we, we started talking about the day of Pentecost. And today I'm talking about wind. I was in Casper, Wyoming here about a week and a half ago. And Casper is one of the windiest cities in the, in the United States. And so I'm trying to prepare and the wind keeps blowing my Bible off the table. And I'd get situated again. The wind would, you know, come in and wreck all my papers and they go flying through the river. And then I'd grab it and come back. Actually, I took a break from the wind to escape the wind. And I was like, I'm going to shoot my bow for a second. And then I'll, I'll get back to studying. I have a picture of that. Can you put that on the screen real quick? You wondered why I gave you the bow. <laughs> so I didn't bring, I'm not bringing that ice chest home. I'm donating that one to Casper Wyoming. So I learned there are some things you don't do when the wind is not favorable. But I kept trying. I'm like, surely I'm going to get this right. And, uh, and, uh, Give him the next picture. That's what happened when the, when the wind changed. Say the wind shifts. The wind shifts. Say I've got to learn to pay attention to the shifting winds. So we were talking about the day of Pentecost and how on the day of Pentecost, uh, it was a mighty rushing what? Yeah. That came in and literally set the pace and really was the divine moment where the gospel became so alive in the, in the hearts of 120 believers that the whole world to this day on planet Earth has been shaken because of that upper room moment. Now, I used to think like upper room, I thought like up here in the church somewhere, right? I thought maybe like, you know, in some corporate setting or some business owner had this like back room and that was the case. And so we were, we were talking about the upper room and talking about when and talking about how it just comes into situations and circumstances. And when you choose to navigate your life listening and feeling and waiting. That's what I love about Nate. Every time I'm around Nate, he has this like ability to be really loud and connect and talk and communicate. And then he has this quiet side where you like, hey, Nate, you there, dude? Like you talk to him and he don't answer you. You're like, what's going on here? What's going on? And he'll walk out. I've seen him at his house. He'll walk out and the wind will be blowing and he'll just stand out there for like 10 or 15 minutes. I know what he's doing. And don't talk to him during these moments. You get no response. I'm sure y'all around here at the church ask him stuff. He's just kind of dazed out. He's not dazed out. He's not, he's not ADD. He's doing that right there. What time is it? What is it? The sons of Issachar had a gift to know the times and to know the seasons. And so we were, we were talking about the day of Pentecost and how this Russian wind comes in. And you know that the Bible says, let me, let me get that thing that we call the Bible here. And in Acts chapter 2, y'all don't have to put it on the screen. I'm going to read it real quick, real quick. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all of one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as a, say this, a rushing mighty wind. And it filled the whole church building. And it filled the whole back room that was upper. No. And it filled the house. The house. Okay. So last time I went to the house, or someone's house, it had to be a big house. There were adults. But where you have adults, you have kids. Have you ever fathomed that maybe in that 120 that God counted... Because somebody counted. There was actually 500 that was told to, to wait and tarry because wind would come. or power, they didn't, We didn't know that wind would come, but power would come and they would be witnesses. That in that 120, where were the kids? Did they not get counted? 
Did they have like a nursery worker watching them? In the back, I, I propose to you there was a room full of fathers, mothers, and kids. And the idea that we probably never in our mind thought that like number 119 could have been a kid. Or number 117 could have been a kid. Or number like 87. We just think 120 like warrior adults. That must have been what happened that day. And that's why we're here today. Right? I, I have to propose, and they had lots of kids back then. That if you had 120 people, then I bet like 50 of them. We're kids. And let's be honest. In your pictures of the day of Pentecost, in your pictures of this massive move of God, have you ever seen it that way? I hadn't either till last night. And I'm shifting my, my word a little bit uh, because I just, there's God's landing on this. That the idea that stand up girls, stand up everybody under 16. So if there's... 500 people or however many people, that you have to know that, that the future of the gospel for all of mankind didn't land in the, ha- in the laps of 120 people. It landed in the laps of a large group of women, children, and kids. All right, you can sit down. So that's just like a side note. And I think maybe we'll camp on that tonight. But I believe that God wants houses to be, that, that, the, that the, the wind of the Holy Ghost is for homes. And when you can affect a home, then you can affect the city. When you can affect a city, you can affect the whole community. And so somebody say mighty rushing wind. And another funny story about wind is uh, Nate. <laughs> it's like my favorite story. So we have this kind of like fishing um, competition thing that we always, you know, do. We're, we're both competitive. And, and so we were actually, last time we were here, we had a 100 fish, you know, competition. I think he caught 102 and I caught like 100, but he had home field advantage. And I caught a seven pounder and like a four pounder. His were all like fingerlings. <laughs> but but he came to I said, look, just come on up to NorCal. Okay? Come on up to NorCal. I got my own lake. We go out there. And so uh and so what I didn't tell him is you gotta watch the wind on this lake because you can uh get blown to the other end and then you spend your whole day trying to get back. It's about a sixty acre lake, and if you get out there and the wind takes you, you're done. Like your whole, it'll take you three hours to get back because you're paddling against the wind. You ever feel like that in life sometimes? You're like, I am trying to get from here to there, and it, it, I just can't seem to get any ground. Like wind can do that, right? It's kind of like shooting your bow in the wind. So wind is meant to be this element that we can't, you know, remember when Jesus talks about the wind? It's all throughout the word of God. It's fascinating to me how much wind is in the Bible. But Jesus sits down with Nicodemus. And Nicodemus is a calculated guy. He's a theologian. Kind of like him. He's a really good fisherman. So at that day, he kind of had his plan. But even though we have our plans, and even though Nicodemus was calculated, Jesus just messed up all of his theology and messed up all of his world in this one simple statement. He said, the kingdom of God is like the wind. He's like, you can't control it. He's like, actually, let's see what he says. Let's go to the word of God on it. So, um, John 3, chapter, John chapter 3, verse 5 through 8. Let's see here. Are you okay? Let's see. Most assuredly, I say to you, unless one is born again of water and spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. That which is born of flesh is flesh, and that which is born of spirit is spirit. Do not marvel that I said you must be born again. The wind blows, say the wind blows, where it wishes. You hear the sound of it, but you cannot tell where it comes from, and you cannot tell where it goes. So is everyone born of the spirit. I think the, it was the NIV says this, um, that, let's see where I put it here. They, basically, you don't know where it comes from, you don't know where it goes, you can't control it. And that, it, For me, that's super fascinating because I, I, I thrive on things that I can't comprehend. That's why I hunt because I, I don't know what they're going to do. I don't know where they get up. I don't know where they're going to go. And so the kingdom of God is like that. And I, I feel like, especially in the era that we're moving into, just in the post, you know, I came here in February. I, uh, we were here at a board meeting. We had, a, uh, we had a great time. I went home, and I've not been back to church via COVID. 
almost. I mean, I might have had a few services in between. We were talking about the car. I'm like, have I been back to church since beyond? That's wild. Are we living in wild times? I mean, in California right now, like we can't go to church. I haven't been to church. I haven't been able to go into the house of God in like a year, nearly. If I was to come back a little later, we've almost been lapsed a year. This is interesting times, guys. And, you know, I, I feel like that, that shifting winds and shifting seasons and what God is up to right now is really even where Nate's saying is what we have to lean into and know that, uh, that we're, we're at a place in history where we're sh- we should be expecting a shift. And, and that we, what we don't want to do is be like Nicodemus and try to comprehend and understand rather than just lean in to maybe what the Spirit of God is saying. So he's trying to explain that, that he needs to, he needs to uh, come out of his head a little bit and get into uh, to what the Spirit of God is saying. And so uh, God started with when, ultimately. So the Bible says in Genesis chapter 1 that when God uh, created man, he breathed life into him. And so the Spirit of God is actually the thing that creates life. Another thing about the Spirit of God is how uh, the, the wind of God is how God cleanses. Remember when, uh, when the flood came, the Bible says a wind arose, and it actually created the event that actually cleansed mankind. And then the next thing is even when Moses goes to deliver the children of Israel, it was a wind that blew God's breath, come in, and actually separated the wind from the ground of the sea, and they were able to come into dry ground. And so it's been these moments of history where God's, when spirit and, uh, and breath are actually the same uh, word in the New Testament, but in the Greek and the Hebrew, it's actually one word. So wind means breath, spirit, and it actually means, uh, it actually means, um, it actually, is how God, I believe, wants to bring us from point A to point B. And so when you're in a place where you can't understand, because we are in a place where we're trying to find out where's our A and where's our B. Me and my wife uh, recently, of course, we had a, a real shift in our life when we decided to move to Redding, California. So here we were, living life, feeling like we, were, we were, had our long-term tra- trajectory and then God shows up, we have a shift, we feel that wind blow into our life, and suddenly we go 1,900 miles across the planet based on a shifting wind. And so having, having yielded to that was a very difficult transition and a difficult turn, but ultimately it panned out to, to activate my children to the Spirit of God, right? And so, and then right now, some of you know, we went from 3,000 foot, just a fun fact about me, to 300 foot, so we actually live in an airstream right now. <laughs> Say, tiny living. And so we actually live. And now take four kids, put them in 300 foot. You're going to get seriously close. You're going to find out a whole lot about each other. And it has, been a, it has been a wild experience. And it's been something that's very unpredictable. And so, like the wind. So say this, paying attention to shifting winds from heaven. Let's go to Acts chapter 27. And when it was decided that we should sail to Italy, they delivered Paul and some of the other prisoners, one named Julius, a centurion in an Augustine regiment. So entering a ship at, I don't know how to pronounce that, we put to sea many in a sail along the coast of Asia in Macedonia and Thessalonica. The next day we landed at Sidon, and Julius treated Paul kindly and gave him the liberty to go to the friends and receive care. When he had put to sea from there, he sailed to the shelter of Cyprus because the winds, say the winds, were contrary. And so basically I'll sum this up. So Paul, at this point, is a prisoner. I was riding with a guy here recently the other day, and uh, so he has, I think, six spas. And uh, that, that's not good in the COVID world. So let's say... Uh, I don't know, how many months, remember I'm not good with time, hit, his business suddenly comes to a screeching halt. He can't take people in. And then he's processing and struggling with like no financial income, right? 
And so I don't know where you're at today. I don't know what you're facing today. Uh, but here Paul is in a similar situation. Because when we think of Paul the Apostle, sometimes we just think like Superman, hero, 13 books of the New Testament, powerful guy. But in this point in Paul's life, he's a prisoner. And he's a prisoner that has no authority at this point, but yet knows who he is. And so even though he's in a point where he's kind of probably feeling stuck, feeling like, I don't know how to get from point A to point B, yet the winds of God are blowing beneath the surface. And so I think that sometimes when we feel like our our trajectory has been kind of grounded, and sometimes when we feel like our point A to our point B doesn't really have clarity, God is still at work beneath the surface. And that was, that's what this story kind of illustrates. So here's Paul, a prisoner. Okay, you get knocked off your horse. You get filled with the Spirit of God. You're like the super apostle. You, you've got this, you know, uh, amazing ministry. You, you're bringing the gospel to the Gentiles. Suddenly you find yourself bringing the word of God to Caesar. And then it all comes to a screeching heart and halt and you're a prisoner. That kind of looks real similar to what you could even comprehend the what's going on in the church world today. You guys are like having church, nobody's wearing masks, all that kind of stuff, but let me just acclimate you globally. In California, we haven't been to church. And so it's a blessing and it's, it's a huge honor and a privilege to know that you guys live in a place that's conducive to, to a lack of communism, <laughs> you know, but where, where we're at, it's like very, very restrictive. We kind of felt like Paul down there, like, ah! But, what, but, but here's the thing, even in Paul's like moment of like, I have no trajectory, it seems like I'm going nowhere, I know I have a call, I know God's got a plan for me, I know he knocked me off my horse, I know I'm supposed to bring the gospel to the Gentiles, I know this is not where I end up, Paul in a moment stands up against the guy and says, hey look, the wind uh, is shifting here and I'm a sailor and let me just go ahead and tell you, this isn't going to end well for you, matter of fact, I think we're all going to die. He releases a word to a secular guy and says, hey, if you don't alter the situation or the direction that we're going via politics, via the world, via disease, via your whole thing, because this isn't Paul's thing, this is their thing, like, hey, you're going to kill yourself and you're going to kill all of us. I'm just going to let you know, that's what's fisting to go down. And so they in their carnal way of thinking and their you know strategic planning come across this south wind and they say oh this is a favorable wind it's like fishing when it's fish when it's the south it blows right in their mouth when it's east fish like bite the least right so they're at a south wind they're like oh okay we can sail but paul's like no no that south wind is a trick that south wind's gonna kill us all and so even though there are natural things in this planet that are, uh, that are driving businesses, that are driving marriages, that are driving politics, that are driving everything that makes the world go round, they're the Pauls of this time. They're the young people of this time who are coming up that say, wait, 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 wait. There's another wind blowing. Wait, 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 wait. I sent something else coming from the, from the vault of heaven. Remember we talked about spiritual IQ. And, no, some, some, that Joseph that says, wait, 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 wait. There's a famine coming. Or that Moses that says, wait, 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 wait. Don't buck against God on this thing. Because you'll end up with a beat up ice chest, right? <laughs> you'll end up paddling up a river that take you all day. He took me fishing yesterday, about killed me. He took me on the other side of the river in 40 mile an hour gusts and said, oh, we're going to paddle out there and fish. I'm like, man, you can't fish in 40 mile an hour wind. You're crazy. We <laughs> have so many fishing stories. But all that, so here Paul is. He's in this moment. He's, uh, he's shipwrecked. Basically, or he's, he's seeing shipwreck. They're seeing favorable winds. He's warning them with the voice of, of the Lord. And they say, hey, we're going out to sea. Of course, what happens? It says a storm called Euroclytops or something like that. I forget what they call it. Anything called that is bad. <laughs> well, something's called like Eurocyclops. You're in a jam. I, that's what happened yesterday. <laughs> so you're out there. Now, now the, the, this crazy wild storm comes in. Suddenly this, uh, this guy leading is like, hey, where's that guy Paul that was talking to us about the wind and that whole thing he had? They go and find Paul, and Paul now goes from the, the lowest guy on the totem pole to the guy with the authority. And he says, look, Now, and he's given a word, we're all going to die. He didn't say like we might. He said, here's what's going to happen. We're going to die. And echoing in the back of their mind is this guy that told us not to sail. 
said, you're going to die. <laughs> Suddenly he becomes a prophet. You know what I mean? The, the guy nobody wants to give any weight to suddenly has the word of the Lord, you know? And they're like, hey, so you said, we're gonna, so, so what do you think, man? And he says, look, let me seek the Lord on this thing. And then because the Lord has a plan to get the gospel somewhere, he says, they're going to live because I have a plan to go somewhere. And in the midst of we're all going to die Suddenly, the gospel is interstreamed in this crisis and in this wild situation because God is at the foundation of it all. He's not the causer of it all, but he's the solution to it all. So I, I, I propose that Paul didn't prophesy death. Paul stated the obvious have got, have, had God not intervened. And I believe that we're, we're such in a similar place right now where maybe the... The, uh, the, the crew isn't seeking out the authoritative voice that sees what God is saying, but ultimately, down there in the doldrums, down there in the back pocket is the word of the Lord. And I think as we navigate our course through here, you'll see that the gospel will be the solution for this whole situation, right? So what turns out to all, so what sometimes seems to be a very conflicting, difficult I don't understand where I'm at. I can't make sense of my situation has to do with the exponential in God's plan for our life. You may say, man, I've, I'm, I'm like Paul because my marriage seems like, like it's not moving forward. It seems like it's going to end. It seems like it's, 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 I, there's no way out of this, but at the end of the day, God has a solution for that situation. Or maybe your business right now you feel so what I'm trying to encourage you by saying no matter where you're at you're not a prisoner shipwreck with a death sentence and the most powerful man of God that maybe ever walked the planet that was his scenario so if we become doomsday people right now in a place where there where God's projecting hope where God does have a way out where God does have a word then and again like speaking in the context of where I live it's a little different it's a little more extreme we have some wild leadership where I come from. So I can speak out of this firsthand because like we can't do nothing. Thank God I got a business that is able to, to continue to flourish and thrive and, and is even doing better. But my buddy over here, nobody can come to his business. So that's when things get real. Things get real when you're just like in chains. Things get real when you've got no way to come from where you are point A to point B, right now, you may say, well, that ain't affected me. But think about, put yourself in their shoes. Put yourself in Paul's shoes. Put yourself in the guy who owns a movie theater shoes. Put yourself in the guy who maybe has a gym right now in their shoes. But remember, God's still speaking into those circumstances and situations. I think it's very important as a church that right now we come to the aid of these circumstances and situations and know that the gospel is going to go forward through these things. Are you all with me? I felt like today I was going to have a word that was not going to be easy to unpack, but it was going to land in certain places. Like, I felt like God's like, hey, trash the notes, just go. And that takes faith for me. Because, like, I could come up here and get a real calculated thing and do something, like, nice and sweet and make sure everybody kind of grabs something and goes home. But that's, I, I, I'm willing to risk my, I almost bombed there a second ago because I'm willing to risk to be able to lay in to what God is saying in the presence of God and for something to connect with somebody in such a way that it could change their life forever. I'm not signed up for polished preaching. I'm not signed up for pretty sermons. I'm signed up for life-changing transactions. I'm signed up for suddenlies. I'm signed up for mighty rushing winds. I'm, that's what the world needs right now. They don't need polished Christianity. They don't need life coaching. They don't need ABCDs. They need the Spirit of God. They need the power of God. And that's what we are to the world today. And I'm telling you, there's something on this church that God, and look, I tangled. I was like, man, I'm going safe. I'm going safe. But, I, but we've got to venture away from safe. And we've got to come and say, no, I'm not trying to blend in. I'm not trying to be a pretty church. I'm not trying to have it all together. I'm not trying to be polished. I want the power of God. I want the word that was able to go into the king's palace and say, God's going to save you. And he's going to save you because I'm with you. And he's going to save you because he's got a plan. It's not about you. you, you you're you doomed, a matter of fact. But because God is here, because I am here, because we are here, then the whole voyage will be saved. Where will we go? We will be saved because we are here and God is here. And that's our destiny. Right? 
But you got to be willing to take risk. You got to be willing to place yourself in that place of risk and, and allow those winds to bump you out of place and bump you out of your comfort zone and bump you out of what's normal and nice. Yeah. We're not in that place anymore. That's right. the, the, our, our nation is not in that place anymore. And I tell you, there's a lot of people, there's a lot of churches that can't make the transition. At least this is a church that can this is a church that's alive. This is a church that hears from God. This is a church that gets up and gives prophetic words. There are not a whole lot of them anymore. And the ones that are are very small and very unpowerful. Because they're kind of weird. <laughs> I was with a guy the other day. He, he leads and runs the, probably the, one of the, the largest, maybe the largest church in the world. Maybe the largest church in the world right now. Or at least in the United States. I spent a couple days with him. And, uh, and he said, uh, it broke my heart. He said, it's a Bethel, man. It's a cool church, huh? Yeah, it's cool, huh? He said, uh, I kind of like the prophetic. That's, that's kind of their thing, huh? You know? And I wasn't feeling like the positive affirmation. You know what I'm saying? I wasn't feeling like he was like, that's awesome. The prophetic is awesome. Man, it's amazing how that's impacted not only your church, but other churches in the world. That, that wasn't what I was hearing. Okay? From probably one of the strongest, most powerful, most wealthiest ministries in the world. What I was hearing was, y'all teach those guys to hear from God? That's dangerous. That's what my, that's what I picked up. It's so sad. That was very sad to me. I mean, Martin Luther nailed it on the door. Don't tell people they can't find out for themselves. Yeah. The, the Bible says no, they don't even need to be taught. They don't even need to be taught. Because God doesn't want to create dependence. God wants to create descendants. I don't need to be telling my daughters what God's saying. They need to be telling me what God's saying. And I'm telling you, I'm telling you, there, that shift of, of you know... Let's spoon feed versus let's create learners and listeners. Is, is, and I'm, I say that to confirm you. And I say that to edify you. And I say that to say that you're able to make the voyage. And I say that to say that this house is a shining beacon that's going to save people that are doomed. Why? Because you can hear from God. And your young people can hear from God. And your old people can hear from God. Old people seeing visions. Young people seeing dreams. Where all we're doing is facilitating people to better come into a place where they don't need you. When have you done your job discipling someone when they don't need you? And how quick can you get there? That's how fast. That's the goal. That's the plan. Friends of God. You know? And uh, so, again, I say that to edify you. I say that to confirm you. And, I, and, I, and, I, and it's glad to be, I'm glad to be in a church that that's the direction. Now, we can increase that, right? We can increase our, 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 our learning. We can increase our knowing. We can, look, uh, Grace uh, had an encounter uh, with a guy. So this guy really can hear the voice of God clearly. I mean, it's, it's amazing. Matter of fact, there were 60,000 people in a coliseum um, here a couple years ago. And he calls a guy out of the crowd and says, hey, look, uh, there's a Joe um, that lives on such and such street. And so this guy, like, he says, I want you to come up. So he comes up. And he says, you haven't seen your dad in 10 years. He said, it drives you crazy. You guys aren't reconciled. Uh, your heart's broken. Um, here's his cell phone number. God gave it to me. Call him right now. You don't have his number. You don't know how to get a hold of him. Guy picks up the phone, calls, and uh, reconciles right there with his dad. They have, like, this crying moment. It, like, changes this guy's life forever. <laughs> Oh, yeah, we're here in church. But like, well, maybe we're not. <laughs> so, I'm one of those people who hear. <laughs> that I got hears. Right? And, I, and I've seen it over and over with this guy. I'm like, this guy can hear clearly from the Lord. It's amazing. We're going to practice some of that tonight. It's going to be fun. But um, so Grace is, uh, I, I know this guy's going to be at a youth camp. So we send... We, we're excited. Me and George are super pumped. We send uh, Grace to this youth camp, and we're like, man, she's going to be in the room with this guy uh, with 100 people. And I mean, like, we're at that point in our life, we are feeling the squeeze of Reading like never before. Like, let me see what time it is. I'm okay. 
Okay, I got to close. We're feeling like the ultimate squeeze of like our transition. Because when you make decisions and the wind shifts and you get out there and you transition, uh, it's not all roses, right? But it's rewarding, right? So here we are. We're in this squeeze. I've made some crazy business things. I I probably got like a a bankruptcy like pistol pointed at my face. I owe 1.8 million in personal guarantees. I had a crazy business deal go down, and I'm like, I'm like at the low of, by the way, all that's over now. The Lord delivered me. That's another story. I'm, I'm out of the, the prison voyage going to death. <laughs> I'm actually sitting on the top now, driving. So, <laughs> and the gospel's been spread and all, all that. We'll share those stories later. But so here we are, me and my wife, constantly dealing with, like, following the Lord the, the conflict sometimes that comes from that, the people who don't understand that, the scenarios that seem to be contradicting that, battling with our identity, but hoping and knowing that we heard God and that, that we knew that this was right and that we were willing to jeopardize and, and leverage everything we have for God to show up because ultimately if that wind doesn't blow, we're done. We're nothing. I don't, I don't want a white house and a picket fence. I'll take one. But at the end of the day, that's not what's important to me. At the, at the core of my life, I want God to show up in my children's life. I want God to show up in my marriage. I want God to, I, want, I don't want a good life. I'm not signed up to have a good life. Everybody has that. Muslims have that. You know, people can plan something and do it. That's not what I want. I want God in it. And if that's what it looks like, that's fine. As long as God's in it. And so here my, my daughter's like <laughs> conked out when like the greatest word giver of all time is in the room because it really doesn't have anything to do with your position because you don't have to be working good enough or studying hard enough or amen enough. But this guy says, is there a grace here from Louisiana? I think you came here from Louisiana. And they're like, So Grace, Grace pops up, and he's walking up, and, and someone texts me and my wife that video when we were just like at the end of ourself, and we, and we see this prophet, this great guy, world-renowned guy, call our daughter out, and it says, your mom's name is Joy, and so mom's seeing this and just, oh my gosh, we're just broken, why? Because God our address God knows right where we are and I would trade millions of dollars and in influence and prestige and power and influence I'd give all that up for my daughter to encounter God you can raise your kids every day you could teach and preach till you're blue in the face you could do everything perfect but until God shows up it doesn't matter you can't control the wind you don't know where it comes from and you don't know where it goes and so we had this moment, he said, uh, so he calls her out, calls my wife's name out, calls out my brother's name, prophesies over my brother, says, you got, a, you got grandparents named Mike and Kay? Calls them out. Says, is your mom named Olivia, her middle name Olivia? I'm telling you like, like 13 things, like nobody knows. And this guy's like, bam, 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 bam. Why? Because God's like, that's how good I know you. And that's the anointing, that's the call. And that's the listening ear that God wants to release in this house. And you need to practice that. You need to come into the practice of allowing the wind of God to come into this place, to tuning your ears into the shifting of what God is saying. And God wants to do some tremendous things with you people. And uh, how about everybody stand up? Sorry, I tanked my sermon and all my little points I had. Do y'all know, do y'all see when I reach that moment where I'm like, all right, I'm not doing that anymore. (laughs) When I was uh, 20 years old, my parents had done everything on God's green earth to have a Christian son, to be raised in a Christian family, to connect with God. And and is there still like a player or something? And, uh, you know, it's funny. (laughs) just sounds better. Nothing that they could do or say could cause me to connect with God. And that's a tough thing, right? It's a tough thing for you. 
with your business. Nothing you can really do or say could put the juice on that thing. Maybe your marriage, maybe you're like, I don't know what to do. Well, maybe you can't do anything. Maybe there's nothing you can do about it. Maybe it's with the church. I don't know what area of your life is, but there are areas in your life, I go ahead and tell you, there's nothing you can do about it. But there's someone who can do something about it. And there's somebody who wants to do something about it. And just like God encountered my, my little girls, I mean, one of them gave a word this morning for Paul, and the other one had an awesome encounter with God, and they've been activated spiritually, and they're, they're going to prophesy tonight. It's going to be awesome. But that's the intangible that you need to go after. That's what time it is in this house, to go after the intangible, to go after that that's not seen, but it's heard and felt. That that's heard and felt. And that's what society needs right now, not what's seen, what's heard and felt. And that's what came into my life and undone me at 20 years old. That's what undone me uh, a couple years later when I made transitions in my life. That's what's undone me to bring me into all the shifting places in my life. And some of you, you say, hey, uh, I feel like I got the wind knocked out of me. There's no wind in me. And I've been through those seasons in life where it's like, I got no wind. I got bones here, but I got no wind. And I need wind in my life. And I just want you today to make a big old funnel. And so I want to talk to two people today. One is the person that, just like me, just like my daughter, you might not be prepared for it when you came to church today, but suddenly there's a, there's a breeze blowing in your life and you can't deny it. And you know that God has shown up and you know that God is speaking to you today and you know that God is stirring you in your heart. You're like, it's not that crazy preacher up there, redneck guy. It's not what he said, but there's something going on in my heart right now. There's something in my insides that are churning and touching and working like those boys that walk with Jesus on the road to Emmaus, that their hearts were burning. And if that's who you are today, I want to give you an opportunity to say yes to God, to say yes to, uh, to his leading and his guiding and his plan for your life. So if you're here today and that's who you are, just bow your head and say, Lord, I invite you into my heart. Maybe you've been ignoring God. Just let that go. Say, hey, Lord, I'm sorry. I'm sorry that I haven't, uh, that, that, that I've sinned, Lord. Sorry that I haven't, I haven't uh, lived my life the way that you would like me to, but I just surrender to your win right now and I receive it. The idea that you feel, God, today is a gift because you can't create the win. You can only receive it. And you're like a sailboat that now that you accept the Lord, God can send you and God can push you into uh, great places. And then the other person here today that maybe you've got the wind knocked out of you. Maybe it was a bad marriage. Maybe it was a bad business. Maybe just COVID is kicking your butt. Maybe you were a school teacher. Maybe, who knows? There's a whole lot of things going on that may have caused you to have the wind come out of your sails or to knock the wind out of you, and you just, you just feel dry, and you, just, you need the wind of God back in your life. Because if that's who you are today, and you just need a touch from God, just raise your hand today. Let's see your hands. Hands all over the room. Father, right now, I just ask, God, that that mighty Russian wind like came on Pentecost, Lord, that you would touch him with it today, God. That they've honored, they've honored you, Lord. They've acknowledged you in a reckless, undignified way just to say, I need wind. And I pray that you allow the wind of the Spirit to flow into their life right now. We thank you for that, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you do the things that only you can do, God. And we, we honor you. We bless your name. In Jesus' mighty name. All right. All right, well, tonight, I think you put it on the screen. Um, we're going to talk about, um, how do you like that? How I did that with Google? Is that pretty cool? <laughs> we're going to talk about the, in, in, the endless search engine to unlimited answers how to access what God is saying in this hour, in this family, in this place for everything pertaining from the little to the, to the, to the large. And then we'll also have some time just to, to, uh, to prophesy and pray. And so look forward to having you guys. Love you. Thanks for putting up with me. 
and uh, have a blessed day. So, 6.30 tonight. So.